It's that time of year again when art galleries around the nation put forth their best artists to kick off the season. I'm Elizabeth Alfano, host of the TV show, web series, and podcast, The Celebrity Dinner Party. On today's episode, I stick close to my old stomping grounds at WGN Radio and interview one of my favorite art dealers and people, Aaron Packer, for a little insight into the inner workings of a successful gallery. So grab a snack and stick around. After a quick word about podcasts and a word from our new sponsor, Adora Therapy, I'll be right back with Aaron Packer for a behind-the-scenes peek into the art world. Life is challenging, and everyone needs a tool they can use to shift their mood in the moment. Adora Therapy is an aromatherapy company that makes mood boost, personal sprays, and room scents for every occasion. Blends like lavender chamomile, cinnamon clove, and blood orange bergamot are only some of the fragrances from Adora Therapy's unique line of specialty scents, carefully mixed to trigger chakra points and to help you boost your mood. Plus, Adora Therapy sprays and roll-ons are pre-blended, vegan, cruelty-free, and ready to go. The perfect size to fit in your purse and take with you to boost your mood anytime, anywhere. So treat yourself to a mood boost and share the gift of stunningly packaged mood boosts with others. Visit adoratherapy.com and don't forget to like us on Facebook. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, The Celebrity Dinner Party, with me, Elizabeth Alfano, on iTunes. Just search for The Celebrity Dinner Party, or if SoundCloud is your thing, you can find me there, too, by searching for The Celebrity Dinner Party. Subscribe, and you'll never have to hunt for engaging and inspiring interviews again. They'll just land on your computer or your iPhone every time a new podcast comes out. So subscribe now to The Celebrity Dinner Party with me, Elizabeth Alfano, because the best conversations really do happen over dinner. I have Aaron Packer, art curator, gallerist, Aaron Packer, in the studio with me. Aaron, how the heck are you? I am fantastic, thank you. So you and I go way back. We do. I've known you. I was looking at the calendar the other day. I had to like pull out the calendar and check out the years. I think it was 1993, but it could have been 1992 that I met you in the Flatiron Building right around around the Coyote. Right, and but your gallery did open by that point or not quite yet? I believe, so taking you back, people, I too had a gallery. I had an art gallery from 1993 until 2001. My gallery started in Bucktown, which is where I met Aaron Packer. But I think I met you in two, maybe 1992 before the gallery actually opened. Yeah, I think I remember you coming in or something saying, I'm going to open a gallery in, in <laughs> and down I have the no street. Idea what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you seem focused, so what's up with it? <laughs> And uh, and I thought we had a great run. I was open in, in the Flatiron Building from 90, late 92 to uh, 98, you know, the fall of 98. And I had a great five-year run there. I loved it. Well, so that leads me to a really interesting segue. You talk about you had a great five-year run in the Flatiron Building, but you're still doing it. You've been doing this now for 25 years, but you're always changing spaces. So tell me where your space is now, but also maybe you can take me through the history of the many galleries, like you say, like the many faces of this person or that person, the many gallery faces of Aaron Packer. Yeah, I've had, I've had quite a few spaces. And at the moment, I basically am a nomadic gallery, which sort of is back to my roots. But if I can short form it, let's see. You know, my history is... Apartment gallery in 87 for many years, and I used to do antique shows. My mother owned an antique quilt gallery. Then I geared towards, you know, uh, renting that Flatiron building eventually. Um, and then a space in the a building. Space in the flat you did not building. have the entire yeah, yeah, yeah. building. I did not have All the right. entire building. <laughs> and then um, from there, I did two years of of what I'm doing now, sort of nomadic. I did shows at Gary Marks Antiques. 
Um, I did. I rented Northern Illinois Gallery for a big show, and then I eventually joined Michael Lyons Weir, who is now in New York. So we were Lyons Weir Packer for like a year and a half, two years, and then um, that's that's when I went to the West Loop on Peoria and Randolph, and I did that for five years uh, in a space that is now filled by Rona, partially by Rona Hoffman, and then from there I went to Packer Schaff Gallery, which was on Lake and Morgan for nine years, and then for the last year and a half, I've been nomadic and, and have probably done like eight, eight different shows over eight different periods of time and, you know, in, in four different places. So this does really speak to your original roots because the artwork that you like to show is outsider art and you now show contemporary art as well. But outsider art, which usually means that the people creating the art don't come from a traditional background of studying and you know they may be self-taught they learned on the street they may or may not have been homeless at some point they have just a very different take on the art world and so it's interesting that you now are sort of bouncing from space to space and um, like you say nomadic why are you nomadic at this point I think after nine years of being in the really big space, everything has changed. The whole art market has changed uh, in, in, in a small sense. You don't necessarily have to have the space. You know, I still have an, a, a, a big Internet presence. You know, things are, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm doing that a little bit, um, if not a lot, depending on who's helping me. And um it's really uh, uh, cost effective also. You d- people don't visit as much as they used to because for the last 10 years, people have been living through the internet. You know, it's much easier to v- visually see a show. You, at least you can get an idea what a show is by going online and perusing, you know, 20 different pieces in a show. And so my theory now, as it was when I first started, was to have uh, usually a Friday night opening and then open Saturday and Sunday and maybe a gallery talk on Sunday afternoon. And that's almost like a pure condensed show. Well, so now your shows, which used to run about five weeks when you had your own proper space that you were renting, now that you're taking these shows kind of on the road, they are as long as a weekend and that's it? Yeah, weekend or, you know, I, I, I do miss doing longer shows because people don't realize that things are so short. Uh, and sometimes they do know, and so that's fine. Um, but uh, uh, I do miss it. Well, sure, and also it's a lot of work to mount a show. It so is. we talk about this general word, a show, but you're you're mounting an art exhibit, so you're doing all the hanging, and you're unpa- you know people have probably shipped you artwork, so you're uncrating it, and then after a weekend, would you crate it back up? Well, no. I'm trying to keep things simple for myself, relatively so. Lately, I've been doing either small, like three person shows where everybody gets a wall, or I do one solo show, and it's lo- you know in general a local artist. Uh, I did a big show with 15 artists at Co-Prosperity Sphere in Bridgeport, and I I think I got one artist to ship me something. And then everybody else, I I definitely am good at uh, uh, planning and and wrangling. That's probably one of my strong suits and, uh, you know, fixed it. So everybody brought their work, you know, in a staggered staggered way and, you know, uh, didn't kill myself on wrapping things. And then the same, the show's over, come and get it, you know, and then if somebody's got a special case, you know, I'm good at dealing with it. So really, you're asking the artist to come and... And hang the work and then you're kind of organizing the collectors getting them in selling the work getting the work promoted maybe even getting things written about the artists in journals reviews etc well it's definitely getting getting the artist to bring the work they don't hang the work I hang all the work I'm very very specific and very um, very picky that's got to go one inch over that way and no don't know your idea is terrible we'll do my <laughs> idea that doesn't look good next to that, that kind of thing. I'm real. That That's a, a, another strong suit. I, I hang shows. I mean, uh, you know, so many different artists and galleries hang shows, but I like to think I've got some special tack hanging a show. So that's kind of cool to think that that's your knack. It, I'm wondering, what is it that has driven you to do this for the last 25 years and at the same time not do your own artwork? Um. I love, you know, I sort of feel like I'm an artist um, just in terms of putting on shows. And that's my, you know, special thing. Um, You know, my mom was a Sunday painter. And like I said, she owned an antique quilt gallery. And my dad was an exhibition designer and an industrial designer. And so he actually uh, 
used to design the booths for AT&T when the Consumer Electronics Show was here in town and, you know, any number of other companies. And so he and I would always talk about the placement of things and, uh, you know, whether I realized it or not, I was sort of a product of my parents. And, you know, years, years ago also I did artwork and I still have artwork ideas and I would love to get around executing them, but, you know, not sure I have the energy or the time anymore. But you get the thrill from being around it. Oh, absolutely. I love artists. Fantastic. You love- totally, totally driven and addicted to it still. Well, that's interesting. The artist or the artwork or both? Um, I think, you know, in the long run, you know, more the, the artwork. Um, although, I, you know, I'm a people person and I love people and most of the artists I work with are unusual in one way, shape or form and some more so than others. And um, so I like wrangling both people and the artwork. And I think often people don't realize how much work the gallery owner gallerist actually does and so it's great to have you here talking about this because I think there is sort of as you say an art form in and of itself to hanging the show bringing the right artists together getting work that's cohesive and having a vision for for the impact that this art can have you know sometimes artists do so much work but of course they're spending their time creating so that artwork could just sit in their garage you know but you're kind of bringing it to the forefront to people so it's a great service honestly I would say it's a great service with that I'm going to head to break really fast. We'll be right back after the break with Aaron Packer. Ah, that's the music of the Websters taking us into the other segment that we have here with Aaron Packer. Aaron, thanks for being here. Thank you again. Uh, So you are a gallery owner, and you've been doing this for about 25 years, but in different spaces all over the city. That's another fun thing. It's not just that you're moving your spaces. It's that I feel your presence has been felt in Bucktown, in West Loop, in River North, and then also in Rogers Park where you live. Sometimes you run things out of your house. Out of my house and uh, uh, also doing things in Evanston, too, of all all places, which is like we live... So close, right Rogers at the end Park. of the city. So yes, so close. We're right, we're right there. So talk to me a little bit about collectors. Right before the break, we were talking about artists and how you represent all these unique, different people. And and as much as you love the artwork, you also love being around the sort of quirky artists. I'll say, but of course, the collectors are kind of quirky in their own right. They are absolutely as quirky, <laughs> if especially more. if they're super serious. You know, if they're in, into having their collections speak for themselves. So my folks, and you know my mother, of course, who says hello. My folks were big into paperweight collecting. So this kind of just gives an insight into the world of the collector, how they can be so specific. So anybody who doesn't know, paperweight is that three-inch, give or take, round glass dome that you see every once in a blue moon, because they're pretty rare now, on someone's desk or maybe on a mantle. My folks chose to really focus on that one odd, obscure thing, and they only wanted paperweights from the ni- from the 1850s. So just to show you, like, collectors have their own very small focus, odd obsession. I mean, they're obsessed. I'll say this is, is this is a phrase I'm, I'm uh, thrilled about at the moment. Hmm. <laughs> yes, I know everybody says that. Why paperweights? What would drive them to paperweights? But they just feel that the artistry, particularly in France, between, like, 1847 and 1850. I mean, actually, to be really specific, they're interested in, like, 1847 and 1848. Oh, my. <laughs> I know, I know. And they're obsessed with anything that could have come out of there. So you must have some obsessed collectors yourself. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of different things, and I throw, try to throw a lot of different art darts, for lack of a better thing to say, and and. Not so much to see what sticks, but I have a broad interest in a lot of different things. Like you said, I do outsider art and folk art, and that's what I'm most well known for, even though almost 90% of everything else I do is actually contemporary art, and I love that too. And we love uh, showing different materials. We have Brian Detmer, the artist who cuts up books in a crazy way. We have you know, other artists, I have about 10 fiber artists because of my, my quilt connection with my mom, somebody who does embroidered x-rays named Matthew Cox, Kathy Halper uh, does embroidery of, uh, you know, pet portraits. And then she does more serious work about being in her mid fifties and seeing where her life has gone. And, you know, Ellen Green, who's like, uh, uh, 
you know, embroidered dresses and then dip them in wax about where she is currently in her life. So, um, and then also I'm really big on really fine painters like hyper realism with surrealist aspects and the occasional abstraction. So what's so neat about this is, you know, you've mentioned in many ways a bunch of obscure things. So dresses covered in wax. And so some people might be listening to this thinking like, what would someone do with a dress coated in wax? And this just general thought might keep them from going to a gallery thinking like, I must not get it. Because since I don't get the connection to the dress and wax, maybe I won't get the art gallery or maybe I shouldn't go or maybe it's just for a certain kind of person or maybe it's just for the obsessed collector. So I can't stress this enough. That is wrong. Galleries are for everyone. Would you agree? That is absolutely the same. I was listening to the Steve Dawson segment and Everybody can be a songwriter. Everybody can enjoy a gallery. And, you know, I don't know if everybody can be an artist, but there's no reason you can't try. And um, but galleries are definitely like a, a free and open thing in general. And uh, it's always great to just walk in and check them out, especially if I have only three days to do it with my next show or something like that. So I'll add to that that uh, maybe everybody can't be a successful artist, but everybody I think can try their hat at being an artist. Sure, why not? Uh, so we talk about like galleries are open to the public and, and they're for everybody. So I'll just give a couple plugs here. Galleries are free, people. So free entertainment, right? Wouldn't you right. say? And I sure. don't mean entertainment in a negative way um, of, you know, commercial entertainment. I mean, like, this is your brain on art, you know, like your brain gets really jumpy and, and when it gets all the stimulus. So it's a free way to really kind of challenge your brain. Agreed. And I'm going to say taking somebody to a gallery, huge first date brownie points. Absolutely. And one of the great things about a date that happens at a gallery, again, free, just in case free didn't come through the first time, it is free. But, you know, it's a conversation starter. So sometimes when you have a first date, you're thinking like, uh-oh, what are we going to talk about? Because I don't really know this person. But now you can talk about the art. Do you like that? Do you not like that? What do you think they're saying here? I don't know. That's sort of weird, but I kind of like it, and I'm not sure why. So immediately you have all these conversation starters. So I always tell people, like, everyone's been to a first date at a bar or a restaurant. Go to a gallery. Yeah, much much better uh, afternoon, uh, uh, you know, break break the ice thing even better you can do it in the afternoon yeah. so perfect for a first yeah. date particularly if you're like internet dating and you don't want to meet at a coffee house again because like the barista at the coffee house knows you through, through all your first dates you want to go someplace else go to a gallery or the friday night you or know friday night first thing. friday openings or second friday or whatever so if anybody's interested in that i can of course send them to packergallery.com correct uh but those are the things that you should do in a gallery basically go what are the things you shouldn't do in a gallery Hmm. You for sure should not touch the art unless, you know, uh, I recently had a show by a blind artist named George Papadakis. And you could act, it was actually OK with me if you picked up the work because it was sort of uh, sanded and softened by a rasp and uh, sort of pleasant to pick up. But in general, you shouldn't even get your fingerprints on even a bronze sculpture. I think, over, you know, that's why the Art Institute, they say don't touch the artwork. And, and fingerprints often show up on a painting or a drawing or you just don't want to do it. Yeah, so I'll add to that. Well, I was saying earlier that I also had an art gallery, and that's how we met, we think, in 1992, although it could have been 1993. And my gallery was glass only. Yeah. So I can tell you, you really don't want to be touching that. And what would really bug me is when people would come in and they would have fake acrylic nails and they would tap on the glasswork to see if it was gra glass or acrylic. So that's a no-no. If you're going into a glass gallery, you're not allowed to tap the artwork. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I want to be always open to people. So I, I try to be as friendly as possible. And, you know, either me or somebody that was working for me, like practically say hello immediately. I was so the same. to be super friendly and, and welcoming. And not so much if you have any questions or, you know, if you want to buy something, let me know, but more just like, hey, come on in. If you have any questions, let me know. And, uh, you know, I don't even necessarily say that. I just say hi in a really happy way. Yes, yes, yes. Because it is all about sort of opening up your mind and your eyes and your senses. And so you want everyone to just be welcome and, and feel as, as welcome and open as they can. 
Absolutely. So what do we have going on now for you? What's the next show that people can see? And again, you can get information at PackerGallery.com, but just tell us what you got on the docket. I have a, I have four shows scheduled for the year, um, although the dates aren't exact. I'm going to do a show at Space 900 in Evanston probably the end of January January with Karen Pearl, who's a great painter of uh, cityscapes of Chicago mostly, really fine sort of Edward Hopper looking things. And how long will that be up? Just That'll a weekend? That'll just be or? a three-day weekend. Fast. deal maybe yeah and 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 maybe it'll go two weeks but um uh not much beyond that um and then probably in march we're going to have a wo- woman named cassie marie edwards and she is a painter of almost like single sculptures like a cat sculpture or a brass trophy of a fish or something like that and she sets them up by themselves with a you know maybe a, a simple you know sort of acid green background and is very makes sort of like abstract marks but the whole thing ends up being a, you know a portrait of this odd object and she is fantastic and I don't know where that show is going to be yet I really want to make a good choice with that and then uh, we're going to have a show at an event space called Concord 55 right near the hideout on Elston and uh, Concord and with a guy named Hank Feely and he's somebody who used to work at Leo Burnett and then changed his life and went to art school later in life after he had an early retirement and is an offbeat artist who lives part-time in Florida and part-time in Traverse City, or not Traverse City, but uh, uh, Glen Arbor up in Michigan. He's a real, and he's an eccentric, even though he's a regular straightforward artist who went and got a BFA from the Art Institute. Cassie, uh, I forget where she went to school, but she's a little offbeat also. And then Karen Pearl is somebody I've known for years and years and years, and I'm, I'm pretty sure she has deg- a degree, but she's a sort of straightforward painter, but sublime. I love it. Aaron Packer bringing the art to the people, taking it around town, literally, from Evanston to, uh, you said, near the hideout. So you're really going to cover all bases. Aaron Packer, gallery owner, taking art to the people. If you want to check out any of those shows, folks, PackerGallery.com. We're going to hit a break. Aaron Thanks for being with me. Very grateful. Thank you so much, old friend. Thanks for joining in on The Celebrity Dinner Party with me, Elizabeth Alfano. To stay in the know, follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at DinnerPartyCHGO and on Facebook at Elizabeth Alfano and at The Dinner Party. To subscribe to this podcast, find The Celebrity Dinner Party on iTunes and on SoundCloud. And if you want to send me an email about today's podcast or anything else, you can find all my information at www.thedinnerparty.tv. The editor of The Celebrity Dinner Party is Andrew Jensen. The original music is by The Websters and Ship Captain Crew. Thanks for listening today and join me on the next Celebrity Dinner Party podcast where the best conversations happen over dinner.